Good morning, everybody, and welcome to TED Talks Ball. I've got a little residual noise here, so I'm going to try and close a few windows, see if that helps. Um, yeah, I'm getting a strange little echo here. Um, well, anyway, good, welcome to TED Talks Ball. This is Brian Rennick uh, from 49ers Web Zone and the Denim Dungeon. Excited to have him on as my guest this morning. Um, let me see if I can figure out this audio real quick, though. No worries. Sometimes it helps when I switch it to this setting. All right. Yeah, I'm getting a little strange one off my laptop, but maybe I'll try to turn that down. Okay, so can you hear me okay, Brian? I can. Okay, great. I hear you just fine. All right. So, yeah, so welcome to TED Talks Ball. Uh, you know, obviously I did a little intro for you there, but please tell yeah. people, you know, where they can find you, what you're up to. Anything else that you want to them to know that I may have missed? Yeah, so uh, I have been with 49ers Web Zone since uh, 2020. Started off as just a contributor and a writer, and moved into uh, the editor role when uh, our our previous editor uh, went back to active duty military. Uh, so I've been doing both now for for a little while. Uh, I'd say probably about a year uh, doing the editing and and writing. I don't I don't write nearly as much as as I edit. Uh, and then uh, this past summer. Uh, Al and Zane, who were doing the no huddle, just the two of them, uh, invited me to to join them. I had uh, subbed in for Al a handful of times over the summer uh, with Zane, and so uh, they uh, they invited me on. I was honored and and excited, and and then not long after after I joined, uh, we were able to partner with uh, Odyssey, uh, and so Odyssey is uh, our distributor of of no huddle podcast now, and. And uh, I was doing Denim Dungeon with my buddy Tim and, you know, with no huddle and, and he's he has a, a job that has taken a little bit more of his time. So haven't been able to do that nearly as much as as either one of us had hoped. Uh, but yeah. And then you can find me on Twitter. Uh, the handles right there at brenick 77 uh, And yeah, so that's what that's what I've been doing. And then Al, just to clarify for those who may not know, that's Al Sacco. Sacco. Yeah, Al Sacco. Yep. And okay. Zane Nackvi. Cool, cool. Yeah. Yep. Two two pillars in the Niners community along with your That's right. So. That was part of that was part of what was uh, you know, so to me such an honor was that they've they've been in the game for a long time now. And so it was a really cool opportunity for me and and then, you know, we've started to have uh more guests on. I got to interview Matt Barrows one on one, which was awesome. Um and uh you know, uh we've got Akash coming on, Akash from Niners Nation. Uh, have a relationship with Jason Aponte and Jordan Elliott. Uh, actually hung out with those guys in person. That's a good crew. Andrew Pasquini, Sprint Right Option. Uh, just a good, just a good 49ers content uh, family that we have. That uh, it's it's really cool to be a part of. No doubt about it. Uh, the family has been like very accepting of me with open arms of, uh, as I've launched this new endeavor of yeah. TED Talks Ball. Uh, gotten a lot of help from people, a lot of really great people who've been on the show. Uh, another one, obviously, with you here today. So just so amazing. Um, you know, I, I definitely can be a little bit prickly on the timeline. And so <laughs> I was a little worried reaching out to people, like asking, like, hey, you want to come be on my show? Because I thought maybe they might be concerned that I'd pull receipts or... Um, you, you know, are, you are the of king of, you are the king of receipts on 49ers Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, especially, especially Rams receipts. And it brings me endless amounts of joy to see, uh, you pulling those on, on those Rams fans. So <laughs> well, well I've been trying to, to tee them up for the Seahawks fans this week and yeah, they're, they're not having any of it, including, <laughs> um, I had a couple of them, uh, lined up for preview shows today. Uh -huh. And uh, one hasn't gotten back to me, and the other one has like tried to sub someone else in for them uh -huh. uh, and do a switch o change o. But you know, we'll see what happens there. I, I hope we get someone. I've been doing preview shows uh, lately with uh, I did three with Dolphins content creators. Awesome. I did one with the Bucks content creator, and I was trying to get some lined up for the cool. Seahawks, but but it seems like they're a little reticent now. With I think you know based on their performance. Um, you know, losing to the week. Panthers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, losing to the Panthers Yikes. and and not be able to stop the run. Um, yeah. you know, no doubt about it. Um, uh, so I mean, maybe do you want to just jump right into Seahawks Niners, or do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the big win over the Bucks from Sunday? Where should we go with the conversation here, Brian? Uh, Ted, I'll let you steer the ship. What do you want? What do you want to talk about? I'm I'm I think down it's for I'm down for whatever. 
I, I usually like to look back before I look forward. And so uh, I'd Good. love to just get your impressions on what you thought of the big win on Sunday at Levi's Brady's homecoming or second homecoming, I guess uh, he had the one in 2016 yeah. uh, against um, our two and 14 Niners, Chip right. Kelly led <laughs> Niners team, a little bit of a difference, you know, between Quite that a, and Sunday. Yeah. Just, a, just a small difference, but it did sound like there were, there were a lot of Brady fans in attendance. I thought maybe they wouldn't show up as well as they did last time, but it sounds like they were there with like, you know, uh, all different kinds of, uh, you know, um, Patriots uniforms and yeah. Bucks uniforms and even some Michigan uh, uniforms. There you go. Or jerseys like were there apparently. So, you know, it's funny. One of my one of my favorite little tidbits from that is, you know, Brock Purdy's parents were in attendance. They they the broadcast showed them multiple times. You know, there's the the iconic shot now of of his dad wiping away tears uh, after he threw. I think it was the Christian McCaffrey touchdown. Um, but but what I the tidbit that I love is that uh, they already had tickets to that game because they wanted to see Tom Brady. So they they had a, it's not like they got tickets because Brock was starting. They already had them. They were coming to see Brady, uh, and apparently they actually don't see a lot of Brock's games uh, either in college or or now. So uh, it's it's kind of interesting. So it'll be it, we'll see if we'll see if we see them more, and I assume that we will. Uh, especially now that he's QB one going forward, but you know that 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 performance on Sunday was, I mean, it was a, a, a demolition of of a team that is likely going to make the playoffs. Now, are they good? You could argue no. Obviously, they they have a losing record, but that defense coming into coming that Bucks defense coming into the game was still ranked 11th in in DVOA. So it's not that they were a pushover. Their problems have largely been on the offensive side of the ball, which is hard to believe when you have Tom Brady as a quarterback, but it just seems like, I don't know, I guess Brady probably the, the, the scuttlebutt is that Brady pushed uh, Arians out. And it, it certainly seems like Leftwich and Bulls were probably not up to the task like Arians was. So a demolition of a team, but this is the NFL, right? I mean, the, the Cowboys beat the Texans by four points on a last second, uh, touchdown to win that game. So it really is any given Sunday. And and so I don't think there's there's any reason to diminish what Brock Purdy and this 49ers team did against the Bucks to the point where Tom Brady himself was like they kicked our ass. Like that's just <laughs> what they did. And to go up 21 to go up 28 nothing in the first half uh you know for Brock Purdy to have the stat line that he had which was uh, 16 of 21 for 185 yards, two touchdowns and a rushing touchdown to have that stat line. And then also know that in the second half, he was two of three for zero yards just tells you all you need to know about that first half. And so I was incredibly impressed, incredibly impressed. I was at the game uh, the weekend before I was at that Miami game and came away impressed from that game, just in that, the moment didn't seem too big for him. You know, he had to come in and, and cold and, and lead this team for damn near the whole game and, you know, demolished another, a playoff team. Uh, although they are on the outside looking in right now after losing to the chargers, but it feels like there was a little bit more gravity coming into this game. It's his first start. Tom Brady's coming home, right? You're, you're facing the goat. You're facing the greatest of all time. The man is the man is quite literally old enough to be his father and not in a, oh, an unfortunate like teen pregnancy way, but like a 23 year old college graduate who's starting a family aged father. Right. Brock Purdy being 22, he'll be 23 later this month. Tom Brady's 45 right now. So all of the storylines, including it being his first start and and he came in and, you know, that that first play he checks out of the out of the call and into an audible and it was the wrong it was the wrong call takes a crown to the ear hole and still you know gets up you know uh bad pass to Debo on second down and then he gets the ball to Kittle to convert that third down and we're off to the races so incredible performance from Purdy incredible performance from that defense I mean it's almost like we don't talk about the defense anymore just because we expect that greatness out of them but yeah, it was uh, it was it was quite the performance, and it was a lot of fun to watch. 
No doubt about it. And I will say, I do have to admit that I didn't get to watch the game live. I was uh, making my way out of a blizzard in Tahoe. Oh, um, okay. yeah, we, we, we had planned to watch the game there in Tahoe. Uh-huh. Um, and But then we lost power and yeah, we didn't know dumb. when it was going to come on. And we're just like, I don't want to spend the night in Tahoe. With no, the heaters were all electrical in the place. And so yeah. we're just like, yeah, uh, let's just hit the road. And I, I luckily, KMBR, you know, has their webcast version uh, so i was able to listen to it on that um but clearly not the same as watching it it just never is and and, and you watch again and you already know it happened so you don't watch the same way uh so i I do have to admit i'm a little bit um you know not up to my usual snuff uh regarding all the emotions of this game and whatnot um i will you know take a little bit of a counterpoint with you a little in that um You know, obviously Brock did great. You only can play against who you face. But I will say that the defense that we faced for the Bucks wasn't the defense that has put up these sort of, I think they're like top 10-ish is is their ranking for the season. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they didn't have uh, Antoine Winfield Jr., who's a hell of a safety. Their other one, I think his name is Mike Edwards, maybe. Uh, Their strong Mm -hmm. safety was out too. Um, No no, um, uh, Sean Murphy Bunting, who's a pretty good cornerback. And I think their nickel corner went down pretty early. But the big one for me and was Vita Vea going Vita, down early. Yeah. I yeah. was really scared about Vita Vea uh, with our, you know, interior offensive line has played well. But, you know, we, we've played a lot of banged up or, or, or not great defensive lines. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of the big things in my preview article that I, I highlighted as a concern was Vita Vea and Akeem Hicks, much more sure. so than maybe like Joe Tryon or the, the, line, the other outside linebacker who got that interception that got called back. Um, I forget his name, uh, but I ultimately, don't. yeah, he's not, he's not a big, he's got like three yeah. sacks for the season. He's not a big name, yeah. but, um, you know, and while I'm talking about that interception that got called back, I would say, I didn't feel like that was a really good call. Uh, you know, wh- where they called holding on Jennings. I felt mm. like Jennings m- was more tripped yeah. himself yeah. and it was within five yards of the line of scrimmage. So I think we, we got away with one there, if you will. But yeah, I well, mean, they, they, they called it holding. They didn't call it pass interference. Yeah. So I think that's that's part of it. And I think because he went to the ground. And so, yeah. you know, and obviously you see a player go to the ground. And as a ref, if you didn't see him trip, then you're going to probably call that 10 oh, times yeah. out of 10. But yeah, I'm not saying the refs Agreed. blew the, you know, I can yeah. see how the refs did they it. They did blow the call, I'm, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, I felt like we were beneficiaries of it. And it was a huge reversal where, you know, we ended up scoring a TD there and they might have gotten a field goal Very or a TD next play. the other direction. Yeah, it was 12 seconds. So, I mean, probably not a TD the other direction, but they might have gotten a field goal against us. Yeah. So it could have been a 10 point swing. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the McCaffrey touchdown was super close. What a great catch by, by CMC. A lot of people have likened it to the Matrix where he's dodging the bullets and he's just kind of, yeah. you know, leaning back and he just scrapes that foot. The and body control is incredible. Incredible, incredible. And and Purdy, you know, with pressure in his face on that one, he had pressure in his face on the Ayuk throw to the TD yep. throw. Uh, the guy just, you know, there's no fear in his eyes or in his game. I mean, I just really like what I'm seeing. I'm just trying to temper it a little bit in that, sure. like, with the Dolphins, they were missing their other safety besides Javon Holland. They were missing, uh, I always mess up the guy's name, Byron Nelson, Byron Murphy. Murphy. No. Murphy. Mur- Murphy. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the one they got from Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I'm just trying to keep my optimism a little bit at bay. Sure. I mean, and there's only two games are at home. But, you know, like if he goes and does well in Seattle, uh, I'm going to feel real good about it. And obviously, as we start to face more playoff defenses, like, um, you know, we got the commanders coming up as one, I think, is a yeah. big test for us here in the regular season. But, uh, I, yeah, I couldn't be much happier with what I've seen from Brock Purdy, to be honest. Yeah, you know, the the I think what I've been most impressed with is his poise, both in, in not allowing the moment to be too big for him, but also his poise in the pocket. You know, we talk about those two touchdowns, you know, with pressure in his face. He was 7 of 8 for, uh, I believe it was 140-plus yards and two touchdowns when pressured. And so, I mean, it's, it's tough to be, (laughs) it's tough to be better than that. And, you know, even against the dolphins, he was facing a lot of those, you know, facing a lot of those uh, zero blitzes, uh, a lot of pressure. They basically just pinned their ears back and said, we're going to rush, you know, four or more every time. 
And, you know, he acquitted himself quite nicely. So, you know, I think the thing that I appreciate about Purdy is that it really feels like each of the limitations that Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance has currently, Brock Purdy is the antithesis to that. And what I mean is that for Jimmy Garoppolo, zero mobility, zero mobility, zero uh, playmaking ability, um, you know, a statue in the pocket won't get out and create, won't extend plays, won't do things like that. Trey will do that. That's great. That's one of the things we love about Trey. For Trey, his limitation is experience. Just doesn't have any, right? A, a year of experience at the FCS level and then, you know, two games last year. Whereas Purdy has four years of starting experience at a Power 5 school. Uh, played the likes of Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Oregon, right? Beat all of those teams, by the way. Um, never beat Iowa, which is, you know, P I've, I've had people tell me that on Twitter. And I'm like, okay. No, no wonder no wonder Kittle likes them so much. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it really feels like it's it's arguably like the best of both worlds, right? You're you're getting the, the field vision and the accuracy of uh of jimmy garoppolo and you're getting the playmaking ability uh of of trey lance the only the only to me the the biggest limit for purdy is is his arm strength and now people will point to that iuke touchdown as an example I, I i don't think that's true if you watch the tape back he can't he is not able to fully step into that throw because he gets absolutely drilled right as he releases that ball. So he wasn't able to fully step into it. I think he's got a little bit more in him. Um, obviously, he doesn't have the, the arm talent of, of Trey Lance, but in this offense specifically, as long as he can attack those the, the deep portion of the pass plays, right? Because Shanahan will every, – every, every pass play that Shanahan dials up has levels to it, right? It's the short, you know, dump off – outlet level, the intermediate level and the deep level. And Jimmy Garoppolo never attacks the deep level. And Purdy will, and that's the thing. And so if he can hit those consistently, whether he has a Trey Lance strength arm or not isn't going to make much of a difference. And so, you know, I think I think the conversation is interesting right now in thinking about, well what what does happen if Brock Purdy leads this team either deep into the playoffs or or to a Super Bowl or, you know, holy grail. What if Brock Purdy leads this team and they win the sixth Lombardi? What does that look like next season? Now, Al and I both said yesterday, that's a problem I would love to have. I, I would take that problem 10 times out of 10, right? Because ultimately in the NFL, everything you do as a franchise, you do with – an eye towards winning the Super Bowl. So they gave up three first round picks to move up to, to draft Trey Lance because they want to win a Super Bowl. If they win a Super Bowl this season, but Trey Lance wasn't the one that led them there, those three picks don't matter. They just don't because you won the Super Bowl, right? So at that point, I think, hey, it's just open competition. Brock Purdy would probably have the leg up, I would assume. But if Trey can beat him out, then so be it. And now all of a sudden you've got arguably you know, one of the best quarterback situations in the NFL. So again, definitely a problem I would love to have. No doubt. I'd love to have it too. Um, you know, and, and, you know, call it a factor, you know, haters would call it an excuse, but I, I would say that part of the reason why the throw to IU maybe didn't have as much zip on it as we might like to see is not just the pressure on his face, but my understanding is that the oblique injury happened pretty early in the second quarter. So yeah. wasn't he already injured at that point too? And it's he hard was. to get a lot yeah. of mustard on the ball when, when you have an injured oblique. So that's an would, excellent point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would give him a little extra credit for that too. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I think arm strength is, is one of the only things, you know, size and height I, I, is yeah. another one. I mean, six ideally one. you'd like to see, yeah, ideally you'd like six, three or taller if you could. But you know, I mean, Breeze was about six one. Mm -hmm. um, well, know, 
Was he? <laughs> was he? <laughs> I, that's the thing is like they list Brock Purdy as six one. I'm like, eh, is he? Uh, well, the he draft those numbers a little bit. I think the draft said six foot five eighths of an inch. So really, okay, six foot so and a half quite inch. Six one. Yeah, not quite six one. No, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like with him. I think that the timing and the poise and the accuracy, I mean, you said as accurate as Jimmy G, I'm going to go ahead and just say, I think he's more accurate than Jimmy G. He doesn't seem to throw as many high hospital balls. He seems yes, to, that's a good point. not so many like in front or behind guys that just guys seem to be catching the ball more in stride. Uh, I've been really impressed with that for sure by him. Um, now, you know, with Lance, you know, next season, Boy, I don't know. Yeah, it'll, it'll depend on how things go. I still am one of those guys who's kind of saying, I need to see us beat some really good teams. I mean, sure. I know that, like you said, the, the Dolphins at the time we beat them were a playoff team. I think they're a playoff caliber, you know, contender type team for sure. Um, as far as uh, the Bucks go, yeah, they're a playoff team, but only because they're in the NFC South, which yeah. one one could argue is the worst division in football. Or I've had other people argue back that the a AFC South is I the say worst. Both but South divisions are yeah, <laughs> are kind of South. They're kind of yeah, yeah kind of below uh, what you'd expect from the rest of the league. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, you know, TBD. We'll see if he, yeah, if he can win a lot of playoff games or go take us on a deep run. It'll be hard to just hand the job back to Lance. That's for sure. Right. And while we're talking about Lance, um, you know, I was pretty on record the whole time this season of saying that I thought he might be back this season. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, like, say for instance, Brock Purdy gets injured, or say like the DC the defensive coordinators figure him out. And, you know, he, he really falls back to earth and, you know, like he doesn't play well in Seattle, doesn't play well on the road, uh, whatever, you know, just becomes ineffective either through injury or through uh, teams figuring mm -hmm. him out, which can happen with new quarterbacks. Um, do you think there's any chance we might see Trey Lance like this season? Obviously, probably not by the end of the season, but if we do make a deep playoff run, that he'd be available, let's say just as a backup, right, at this point. Not, yeah. Not like um, shove him in the starting role. You know, do I think he will? No, mainly because Shanahan feels like he has closed the door on that. But at the same time, if I were Kyle Shanahan, no part of me would be like, yeah, like we think we're going to have him back. You know, that's a that's an advantage. That would be a, 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 a an advantage for Shanahan if, you know, all of a sudden, you know, news breaks. Hey, Trey Lance is being activated. Trey Lance is, you know, is is going to be QB2 or whatever, Um, you know. It, it appears that that he has fully healed from the injury doesn't mean that he's ready to play football, but it does appear that the injury is fully healed, uh, which is great news. Um, and so it would just be a matter of being cleared to play football and then getting enough practice in to be a viable option. And so that's where I feel like there's probably not enough time because I don't think he's cleared to play yet. And so, you know, we've got four weeks left before the playoffs. The 49ers are not getting a bye. The Eagles are, you know, on the inside track to, to the number one seed. Uh, the 49ers can still get the number two seed, which I think is, is, is an important goal to, to look at uh, outside of the division, you know, with a victory, with the victory in, in, in Seattle on Thursday, they clinched the division, but you know, they're one game behind Minnesota for, for that number two seed, which would be huge because that would mean two home playoff games. And if let's say Dallas goes into Philly in the divisional round and beats them, then 49ers, well, regardless, if they got a three seed, they, they would host, they would host that game anyway. Um, but it would be, it would allow them to host the wild card round and the divisional round and then be set up to, you know, host the NFC championship game if anybody, anybody but Philly, uh, you know, makes it. So I, I just don't, th I just don't think there's enough time. Like I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to get myself all hyped up and hoped for, you know, for him to return only to, you know, only to get that squashed. And so I, I just think, I just think it's, it's, 
it's going to be Brock Purdy and Josh Johnson the rest of the way. And if Trey Lance and or Jimmy Garoppolo come back, uh, then then that would be incredible. But here's the other thing. And here's the for me, the biggest reason why I don't think Trey Lance will be back. They only have two IR return designations left. And Shanahan said yesterday, Kinlaw will begin practicing after the Seattle game. And they expect Elijah Mitchell back by the end of the season and into the playoffs. And so I think those are their two their, their two des, uh, designations to return that they're going to use, which means that Trey Lance wouldn't be able to return anyway. So really the the hope for 49er fans, if if they're hoping for someone other than Josh Johnson, at this point is Jimmy Garoppolo because he's not on IR. Fair enough, fair enough. Although it did sound like that one's kind of gone back and forth too. Initially, they said list Frank yeah. and surgery done for the season. Then they said seven to eight weeks might be back. And then the latest is saying multiple months. So probably not back. But yeah, you never know. These things do change. It's, it's a yeah. fluid situation. Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder about, um, you know, the whole Kim Law situation. I, I, I'm, I wonder if he'll be back at all. But uh, yeah, he would be a big one, and, and Elijah Mitchell would be another one. Uh, and then, did Ridgeway go on IR at all? Ridgeway is not on IR for I think okay. the same reason, basically, because they only have yeah. two designations left. And so, like you, you look at the fifty-three man right now, and I can't remember who tweeted. I think it was Barrows tweeted out yesterday. You can already look at who who you know are going to be inactives on Thursday, simply mm-hmm. because they've got five guys that are injured that are not on IR, right? So you've got Garoppolo, you've got uh, Ridgeway, you've got, um, uh, who else? Uh, Kevin Givens now, and Mm -hmm. you've got, and and that's the other reason why I think they're either hoping and or saying, no, Kinla, you got to come back. Uh, They're they're really thin at D-tackle now. With Givens out, with Ridgeway out, um, and so right now it's Eric Armstead, T Y McGill, and you know, really nobody else in terms of actual, just straight up on the roster defensive tackle, right? You've, you've got a uh, hider who plays inside. You've got Omenahu who slides inside Drake Jackson, Jordan Willis. You've got all those guys, but they aren't, they aren't the first and second down defensive tackles. They are the third down defensive tackles. So uh, I think it's important for Kinlaw to come back, and and hopefully he does. Uh, and and you know if if he's healthy and can stay healthy, I think that is a a massive boost to this to this off or to this defensive line. Yeah, I'm a big Kinlaw fan. When he plays, he's a real difference maker. I've he heard some seen some people on the timeline say, "Oh, well, he hasn't played enough to be an impact player," and that's just not true. He he makes a huge impact when he's in there. He eats double teams. The guy's a physical force. He's just a monster of a man. And mm-hmm. even if he doesn't have a lot of stats that back that up, you know, the eye test will tell you that he makes a big difference and he's tough to block. And the other the other players all feed off of it and play better when he's in there. So I don't care if he doesn't have sacks or, you know, right. tackles or whatever. He, he's he's good by me, 100%. So if he can't Very come similar. back and, and stay healthy, then I would welcome him back. I just would hate to use up that return roster spot just to have his knee flare up again uh which right is and that's a great enough. point like you don't want to you don't want to activate him just to activate him and then have him go down you know two games in because his knee wasn't ready that that's an excellent point uh but yeah you know same thing with eric armstead right like he, he's his stats aren't going to show up but his impact shows up everywhere on the defense and so you know to combine you know if, if to to go into the playoffs with the you know the the day one defensive line rotation that you wanted which is bosa armstead kinlaw and ebukam right on 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 first and second down and then you know you get your turbo package out on third down um that would be huge that would be huge for no a defense it's it. already number one in the league right the rich yeah. get rich yeah, no doubt about it. And let's yeah, let's talk a little bit more about the D. Well, and then as far as Armstead, I was just going to throw in one more thing. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, he didn't really have the stats in say like the Dolphins game, but like look at the Jimmy Ward interception. He almost got to two on that responsible one. Responsible for it. Yeah, exactly. It was his pressure caused him to throw a bad ball that Jimmy Ward, you know, picked off. I love that too, where 
Um, you know, where Jeff Wilson Jr. realized he couldn't get to it, went low on Jimmy Ward, and Jimmy just vaulted him and dove and made a great diving interception. It was a beautiful yeah. play. And yeah. then the other one, too, was uh, – now, this might have been another one of those calls that I maybe don't necessarily agree with, but he got it nonetheless where Kinlaw – or not Kinlaw, Armstead was held – on a big uh, Mostert run, and it got mm. the run called back. Yeah. And it looked kind of ticky-tack hole, but nonetheless, he generated a holding penalty. And, you know, and, and I'll say this, you know, big players, big names, you know, if there is a, 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 a ticky-tack foul call, sometimes those are the guys who get them, right? They get the benefit of the doubt, whereas a no-name player isn't going to get that. And so it's just one more thing that Eric Armstead brings to the table. Um, I always complain that we get, you know, jammed by the refs a lot, but I also have to admit when I think that they did us a favor. Sure. Uh, so, but, but listen, if they're not ever going to call holding on Nick Bosa, I'm going to take every ticky tack hold that, that we get all the time, every time. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Fair is fair. Um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta, uh, make up for that somehow. Cause it's true. Right. Nick just gets held, uh, in an insane level. And, and I kind of understand it. It's it's like if they didn't allow offensive linemen to hold Bosa on nearly every play, he would just ruin their <laughs> offense. It'd, it'd, sure. You know, the, the NFL is all about offense, and so he'd have I, yeah, he'd have like forty sacks. <laughs> he would. It would be it would be something ridiculous like yeah. that, no doubt about it. Uh, should we talk about the rest of the defense then from the yeah. Bucks game? Uh, they, they had a great game, but I'll, I'll let you go into your uh, impressions on it. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, like I said, it, it, I'm starting to run out of things to talk about with this defense just because it's so good every every game. You know, since that Chiefs game, if you if you take out that Chiefs game and the Falcons game, which are the two games that this defense has allowed the most points, if you take those two, if you take those two games out, they have allowed on the season, an average of 11 points a game. 11. Is that good, Brian? Is that good? That seems good, right? That seems pretty good. I, I think yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, in the in the six games that they've, that the six game winning streak that they're on right now. So once they, once they, you know, got their ass kicked by the Chiefs and said, okay, well, we're not going to have that happen again. So on this six game win streak, they've allowed 67 points, which is, 10.7 points a game. You're going to win every game. You're, if, if your defense is playing that level, you're going to win every game because that's a touchdown and, and, and two field goals and, and 13 points is going <laughs> to, is enough for this defense. And it's, it's bonkers. It's just absolutely insane that they're playing at the level that they're playing and it's everywhere. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a spot on the defense where I could point to and go, man, I really wish like this defense is awesome, but if they could play better here, like they would be, no, they're playing incredible everywhere. Right. Emmanuel Mosley goes down. We think, oh man, huge loss. And I, and I, I think it is, you know, Emmanuel Mosley was an underrated uh, cover corner in the NFL. You know, one of the better ones that, that people don't talk about. And then you go, oh, they're going to slide Diamador Lenore out there. Last time I saw Diamador Lenore outside, he got burned in Philadelphia and then went on a milk carton for the rest of the season, and we never saw him again. And so I'm like, well, how, why are they sliding him out there? Why aren't they putting Womack out there? Or why aren't they putting Ambry Thomas out there, right? Ambry Thomas had came on at the end of last season, looked and played great, had that game-sealing interception in Week 18 to send him to the, to the playoffs. Like, he played really well. Haven't seen Ambry Thomas at all this season. Diamador Lenore came in. They they slid Jimmy Ward down to the slot, kept Tayshawn Gibson and, and Talano Hufunga as our safety, and haven't missed a beat. Diamador Lenore is locking down the outside like he's Emmanuel Mosley. And the linebackers, I mean, Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw are the best linebacker doing the NFL. I full stop. Like Argue with a wall if you think differently. <laughs> they are incredible. Drake Greenlaw, the game that he had on Sunday, 15 tackles, an interception. I mean, just balling out. And Aziz, like we don't talk about Aziz enough because Dre and Fred are playing so well, but Aziz, Aziz would be a starter 
on every other team, right? And he's the third linebacker here uh, and gets taken off the field when they go into nickel. But, man, it, and then the defensive line. I mean, the defensive line is what we always thought it would be. They've been incredible. Are they racking up the sack numbers we thought they would? No, but they have a, a, a an impressive pressure rate. And, again, pressure is almost more important than sacks because pressure – forces quarterbacks into bad throws and this team it, you know has ball hawks everywhere and so you know they they have more interceptions than touchdowns allowed through the air like <laughs> it doesn't get better than that it doesn't get better than that i love it it's so fun to watch now you you nailed it um you know, I think people were worried about Jimmy Ward when he came back, but I think they didn't keep in consideration that, you know, he missed eight or nine games. He was needed to get back into game shape. He was playing with a club on his hand. Yeah. And so it took him several games to sort of bounce back into shape, but now he's looking great. Lenore has been really good. I think the reason why he got the nod over all the other guys you mentioned was just tackling ability mm -hmm. and, you know, just that run fit. Um, and so I think that's been a big key to our defense is just, you know, got to stop the run first and just look at the Seattle Seahawks, look at the Chargers last year, Chargers to a certain extent this year too. Uh, if you can't stop the run, you're, you're not going to win a lot of games, even if you have uh, a great offense, great QB, great weapons. So this, this defense has not allowed an individual rusher to gain 60 yards this season. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's incredible. Now that's that going to. It, the rubber is going to meet the road Thursday, right? Uh, with Kenneth Walker and, and that Seattle offense, although Walker's a little banged up, uh, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I think he'll play, but I do yeah, too. haven't allowed a, a rusher to gain six, an individual rusher to gain 60 yards. Like no just, doubt. And you, and you throw out the Atlanta game and you know, seven of those 28 points that Atlanta scored wasn't, on our defense, right? It was on the Jeff Wilson Jr. Right. fumble six. So they really only scored 21 with their offense. And our defense was so banged up in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously no Bosa and so many other key players were missing. Obviously no Armstead yeah. and uh, you know, Jimmy Ward and you yeah. know, just so many key players missing. And at least three or four others too. I mean, that's, and the second oh, half, Emmanuel yeah. Mosley had just gone down, right? So yeah, the, so, yeah like Wom before. Womack got torched in that game. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, I mean, the defense is incredible. I mean, there was a point in the season where I was saying that they were kind of overrated because we'd faced some weak quarterbacks to start the season and weak offensive lines. And because, uh, you know, well, actually, O-line has been a, a common theme throughout even some of our more recent opponents. The Rams sure. have had their O-line struggles. The Cards had four out of five missing off theirs. Even the Saints were missing their starting center. Um but, you know, now that Eric Armstead's back, it's kind of like, yeah, I think they're kind of living up to that number one billing, um, you know, where the stats aren't misleading. Because sometimes you can be statistically number one, but like eye test or like gut feel says, oh, I still have some reservations. Uh, I'll just say since Eric Armstead's been back, my reservations are gone. Um, you know, we obviously held uh, the, the Dolphins to 17 and the Bucks to seven. So uh, that's a, it's incredible. Well, and, and you look at that Dolphins game and outside of that 75 yard touchdown to start the game mm -hmm. and the 45 yard touchdown to Tyreek Hill, uh, they allowed, it was like, I think it was less than 150 total yards to that Dolphins mm -hmm. offense, which uh, again, coming into the game was people were talking about it being the best offense in the NFL. So, you know, and then we broke Tua. like as a defense, we broke a quarterback right? And you, you see his performance against uh, the Chargers Sunday night. Now, granted, Staley just essentially Xerox the 49ers uh, game plan and said, all right, we'll do that too. And, and, and that's part of it. But, you know, that also speaks to D'Amico Ryans and his ability to game plan against an offense and, and, and attack an offense in a way that they may not be expecting. And so, you know, it's it's a total package, and so I'll I'll miss D'Amico next year when he's gone because I'm almost certain that he will be. Uh, so that's going to be a big loss. But uh, I also think that Vic Fangio is kind of waiting in the wings, so that could be an interesting, uh, you know, in, in, an interesting development. Um, you know, I talked to Barrows about that on No Huddle, and I was asking him if 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 Fangio would be the likely replacement, and you know, his 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 response 
kind of hinged on the idea that, you know, Fangio runs a three, four and Nick Bosa prior to the 2019 draft, you know, the, the Cardinals were running a three, four at the time. And he basically said like, I, I want to, I want to, I want to play with my hand in the dirt. And so, and then, and then part of what makes this defense so good is Chris Kasurik and Chris Kasurik coaches a specific, a very specific uh, D line technique in that, in that wide nine, which is a four, three, uh, you know, a four, three alignment. So it would be interesting to see if Fangio did come in, if, if, if he would keep that four, three, or, you know, try and convince Bosa, Hey, look what I did for Alden Smith. I can do the same thing for you. So. That'll be interesting. But yeah, this defense is just incredible. No doubt about it. I'm with you 100%. And I, you answered my question about Fangio, which is, can he do the 4-3? Because it seems like uh, I already knew the Bosa piece, but I hadn't even made the Kassarik connection too. Yeah. Uh, so that's a super important uh, consideration when you can just sort of churn out D linemen the way we have with him, just re- reclaim you know, former first round picks a lot of times and turn them back into what they were supposed to be when they were drafted and and fell short of with other teams. Yeah. So, um, (laughs) yeah, Arden key. And, uh, you know, I'd say I'd throw a Menahu and I'd be calm into there. Not that they were first round picks, but, uh, they're, they're definitely, uh, performing much higher for us than they did for the Rams or the Texans. Yeah. No doubt. Um, no what about, uh, like the running back room, uh, CMC, Jordan Mason juice. How, what'd you think of them? Yeah. You know, the, the interesting thing the Christian McCaffrey, uh, I mean, the Christian McCaffrey trade literally saved this season. And I, I don't know that there's been a more impactful midseason trade in NFL history. Uh, the 49ers offense was 21st in DVOA, uh, prior to the Christian McCaffrey trade. And as of today, I don't know if Football Outsiders has uh, put out their new DVOA um, numbers yet, but as of yesterday, pre-Monday night game, uh, they were fourth in offensive DVOA uh, when they were 21st. Now, DVOA is, is an efficiency metric, and so they it, it's very similar to war and wins above replacement. Basically, you know, they are measuring your offensive performance based on what an average NFL offense would produce in that given scenario against that opponent, all of that. They take it all into consideration. And a 0% is average. And so if you're on offense, if you're positive, that means that you're above average. If you're negative, that means you're below average. As uh, as of week six, prior to that Christian McCaffrey trade, they were 21st in DVOA at minus 3.7%, which meant that they were performing below average. Since McCaffrey trade, they are fourth in offensive DVOA at 21, I believe it's 21.7%, um, which means that they <laughs> they have gotten significantly better um, on, on the season as a whole. Uh, okay, their new ones are out. So they are third now. They are third at 25.3%. The only two offenses that are better than them are the Eagles at 32.1% and the Bills at 32%. This is a pretty significant difference, but um, outside of those two, the 49ers are third. So Christian McCaffrey single-handedly saved the season and then single-handedly transformed this offense from a below average offense to one of the best offenses in the NFL. And it'll be interesting to see how things shake out with Debo not on the field, because I tweeted this out yesterday. The biggest advantage that Christian McCaffrey has given Kyle Shanahan as a play caller is the ability to to live in 21 personnel. 21 personnel, for those that are listening that don't know, that's that's just verbiage that says you have two running backs and one tight end on the field, which means in terms of skill positions, you have two running backs, a tight end, and two wide receivers out wide. So you have five skill position players on the field. Most teams in the NFL... When they are in 21 personnel, that is a running personnel. They're going to run the ball. With the 49ers, in 21 personnel, you have Christian McCaffrey, Kyle Juszczyk, George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and Debo Samuel on the field at the same time. Kyle Shanahan can motion to empty, put Juice and, and McCaffrey in the pattern, and you've got five elite pass catchers out running routes. 
No other team in the NFL can, can boast that. No other team. And so it's a huge advantage because in 21 personnel, the opposing defense is playing in their base personnel, which if they're a 4-3, that means they've got three linebackers on the field. If they're a 3-4, it means they've got four linebackers on the field. I love Debo Samuel, Christian McCaffrey, Kyle Yushek, George Kittle, Brandon Yu. I love their advantage on any linebacker. I, I will take that matchup 11 times out of 10. <laughs> and so, like I said, McCaffrey has absolutely transformed this offense into one of the best in the NFL. And so with Debo down right now, uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of how, how Shanahan adjusts, right? Because will he continue to try and live in 21 personnel and instead of Debo have Jennings or have Gray or have McLeod? Maybe, but that doesn't do the same thing to the defense that, that Debo does. Because again, Debo can motion from out wide into the backfield. And now all of a sudden you're like, all right, now who's going to get the ball? Debo or McCaffrey? Either one can run the ball, right? So it just puts the defense in conflict all the time. And so I think that is going, he, he's going to struggle with that, with Debo off the field. Uh, but what I hope is that he starts to, to maybe go, I don't want to say more conservative, but more with a more run heavy approach. And if that's the case, then I hope we start to see uh, more of Jordan Mason because Jordan Mason in the limited snaps that he's had looks absolutely incredible um, running up the gut. Uh, he doesn't have enough uh, carries to qualify, but if he did his, I think it's two point. It's almost, he's almost averaging three yards after contact, which if he had enough carries to qualify would by far and away lead the NFL. So a lot of these, inside runs that McCaffrey's getting, I'm hoping start to go to Jordan Mason a little bit more. Um, and then you've got TDP. Who I literally, I, I have no idea what to expect out of him because we just haven't seen him. And then Tevin Coleman, you know, is Tevin Coleman. We know what to expect there. So, you know, it, it, the, the running back room is, is fine. And once Elijah Mitchell gets back, man, going to be incredible. But, um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what this offense looks like without Debo. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned, but uh, luckily, you know the Seahawks uh, defense hasn't been very good against the yeah. run in general, and they really fell apart against the Panthers when Al Woods went out. Uh, he's definitely one of those Vince Wilfork type of space eating defensive tackles who just really hard to move off his mark and hard to run run it around him. Uh, so it looks like he's sort of doubtful for this week, but you know we'll have to wait and see. Uh, today and tomorrow's practices will tell us a lot about Al Woods. Like you said, I think Kenneth Walker will play. Al Woods, sounding like so far won't, but uh, you know we'll see. We'll see. And uh, Brian, just want to call Brian Culp agrees with you about CMC. Um, you know, sure. really helping out the season and you know totally transforming our saving our season. Like you said, one of the most impactful mid-season trades ever. Um, I would throw Von Miller up there with with the Rams last season uh, as one it's of those. One. To, yeah, since sure. they won the Super Bowl. But I mean, I think if we yeah. win the Super Bowl, we could say the same thing. Or even if we make no a deep playoff run, yeah. I also want to give Callie Young, Kali Young, part of me, um, saying hi, hey Ted, what's good? Um, so thanks for for coming in and, and joining the audience. Let us know if you guys uh, you know disagree with anything. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to be polite and agree. We, we want to hear from everybody. We don't want to spread any bad info. Um, you know, uh, uh, so let us let us have it. If, if there's you know, it's something. interesting. You you brought up Al Woods, Ted. Um, Pete Carroll was talking after the game because the question he got was this new offense, this new defense that they're that they're running in Seattle. It's not the typical Pete Carroll cover three uh, defense that they're running. Um, asked if they have the right players for it. And one of the things he said was in that game specifically against the Panthers, they were actually lining out woods up uh, at defensive end. Uh, no way. And, and, uh, and it was successful until he went out with injury and then, you know, things crumbled. And so if woods plays, it will be interesting to see if they try that same thing again, if they try and 
line him up at uh, at the end, which, you know, against the 49ers would would really uh, kind of wreak havoc on that on that outside zone that they want to run. Because he'd be difficult to move. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. Now, when you say defensive end, though, did you mean like an R four three system, like a Bosa? So they're defensive running, a, so, yeah. So they're running a three four. So normally, okay, so. Outwoods in a three four would be that so more like a Christian like Wilkins. Yeah, yeah. So like instead Christian of Wilkins having him, instead of having him at nose, they they bumped him out to to end. Um, which, it, as as Forty Nine er fans, uh, think uh, Justin Smith. If, yeah, if that, the Cowboy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or or who we just saw recently against the Dolphins, Christian Wilkins. Yes, uh, yeah. he's a DN, but he's I consider him more of a D interior mm-hmm. type of player. Uh, what I would normally call a D tackle, but there's only yeah. one D tackle in, in that three four system versus two in ours. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay, cool. Uh, Kali Young was asking, do we think Kinlaw's available for the playoffs? I they're they're trying to manage the swelling in his knee. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like he'll be back to practice after this game, but. It sounded like he was going to be back to practice a few times recently. So I, I, I yeah. have my healthy skepticism about him. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to say yes or no. Um, all we can do is go by what coach says. And, and Shanahan said that, that the plan is to have him start practicing after the Seattle game. So, I mean, we'll just have to see if, if he does. And, and, you know, I don't, they're not facing a team moving forward. So it's, it's Seattle obviously and he's not playing in this game so we can scratch seattle right so after seattle it's uh washington and then it's uh uh las vegas and then it's it's the the cardinals and so obviously josh jacobs having a, a hell of a season a career year for him uh they run the ball a lot so that could be uh that could be an issue but you know i i think if if they could get through these next four games without activating him so that all they're doing is activating him for the playoffs. I I would argue that is probably what would be best for him and for the team. I like that. I like that a lot. I just uh, hope we get him back. Like you said, Brian, we're, we're very thin at defensive tackle uh, with Givens with the MCL. That's going to take us through the end of the season and probably fairly deep into the playoff run. Yeah. Um, you know, Kim Law's out. Uh, who am I missing? Hyder. Okay. It sounds like Hyder might play this week, but he's yeah. he's not. But he's not a true defensive tackle, like a run stuffer. Right. Um, right. We got Ty McGill, like you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, Eric Armstead. Um, wasn't it's really there those one... two. Those are really the only two defensive, true defensive tackles that we have on the roster right now that aren't injured, right? Because Ridgeway is still on the fifty-three man, uh, but he's has that that uh, torn pec. And so mm-hmm. I, I don't think he'll be back. If he's back, it would be uh, either NFC Championship game or Super Bowl if they make it that far. Um, and then, uh, like you said, Givens has that MCL sprain, which MCL sprain is the is the 2022 version of the high ankle sprain of 2020. Um, just seems like, you know, Mitchell has two of them. Uh, Debo has an MCL sprain. Uh, Givens has an MCL sprain. Uh Aziz had an MCL sprain earlier this season. It's just like what, like McKivitz had one. Yeah, that's right. McKivitz had one. It's like mm-hmm. they just pick a, a specific injury and they're like, "This is what we're going to do this season." It's like, what the heck? Wasn't there a D tackle who was like a Caseric guy that we brought in? Um, I'm blanking on his name. Um, hmm. I'd probably need to look up the uh, depth chart for him, um, but. Uh, a D tackle? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can grab it here real quick. Sorry for the delay. Um, McGill, Ridgeway. No, it's not, he's not showing up on here. So he must be a practice squad guy. Um, and that's the other thing is I don't even think they have a bunch of guys on the practice squad anymore uh, with, you know, McGill being uh, elevated and um, – you know, like I said, they have a lot of hybrid guys, right? You know, mm-hmm. those what you would consider the big end, you know, big end yeah, body. The, the Ronald Blair, Hyder. Yeah, Hyder, uh, Willis, even Willis. a Menahu. You could even yeah. argue Drake Jackson, right? Drake Jackson's a bigger end. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he's bigger than, than Bosa. He's got just crazy, freaky, athletic bend. Um, mm-hmm. You know, watching that guy do, like, back layouts, and you're like, what? 
a human being that size should not be able to do that. He is just freakishly athletic. Um, but Drake still, Batson, yeah. I'm calling him. There you go. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. No doubt about it. Uh, should we talk a little bit about uh, Ayuk, Kittle, Jennings, Debo? I, I've got quad confusion on there. That's an old slide. Uh, obviously, now it's the MCL and the um, and it's the an MCL and ankle IA. sprain. Yeah, and they said they expect him to be back in the regular season, which is crazy to me. But all I all I know, and I again I tweeted this yesterday, is one. You know, you can thank Debo's thickness for for no injury there because you know muscle muscle mass is is one of the one of the easiest ways to protect your joints, right? Build up muscle around the joint, and Debo's lower half is one of the most muscular on the team, right? For for you know pound for pound, if you will, um, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that he did not injure himself worse. Now. The ankle is be, you, there's really not a whole lot you know you can do to to save that. So again, the fact that it's just a high ankle sprain uh, blows my mind. If that tackle occurred on turf, that would have been devastating. And so just grateful that Levi's has grass, but again, kind of highlights this this push for from the players to start getting artificial turf out of the NFL because there's no there's no reason for it these turf is owners, turf is the devil i like to yeah, say there's oh, all of these owners are billionaires they can afford to to pay to maintain some grass if you can have grass year round in green bay there's no excuse anywhere else sorry there's just <laughs> not exactly. there's just not no doubt about it um should we talk a little bit about the seahawks game predictions what, what do you think you know i i think i think purdy will play um you know, I I don't think they want to go into this game knowing that they can clinch the division. They're wearing the white throwbacks. So it's like it's very reminiscent of uh, 2019 when they went up to Seattle and clinched the division, the clinch by an inch, right? The the Dre Greenlaw tackle of uh, Jacob Hollister at the one yard line. Um, so I think Purdy will play. And I think this defense, uh, this defense already shut down Geno Smith and this offense. Kenneth Walker wasn't a part of it in, in week two. And, and so there, there is a little bit of concern on my end that, you know, Walker Walker's having a hell of a year and, and, and that could be, you know, I think if Walker, if Walker has success against the defense, I think, I think the, the Seahawks offense as a whole will also. Um, but I, I, I I'm pretty confident that this team is going to go up there and, and, and pull out the victory. Do I think it's going to be a blowout? I don't, but I haven't predicted a blowout yet this season and they've, they've had a few. So um, I, you know, I, 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 like I said, I think Purdy will play. This will be the first time he starts in a hostile environment and Seattle is a very hostile environment. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where his poise is there, right? That's one of the things that we like a lot about him as his poise and, and, and the moment not being too big for him. And so the opportunity to clinch the division against your hated rival in their own stadium on a short week, you know, it, it, it's all, it's, it is all stacked against him, if you will. And so if he comes out and, and plays like he did the past two games, then, you know, the sky really is the limit for, for this kid and, and, and for this offense. But I do think they'll end up pulling out the victory. Um, I haven't, I haven't looked into it enough yet to, to give my score prediction, but I do think that they'll win. Yes. I'm with you hundred percent. I think it'll be a close game. We've only won really once up there that I can remember in the last decade or so. Uh, <laughs> this is, this is definitely not, not one of their stronger squads, especially defensively, especially against the run which should bode well for us. But, you know, having Debo out tempers my my enthusiasm for our offense quite a bit. Yeah. He's such a huge piece, such a huge check down, you know, safety valve, compliment to Christian McCaffrey, all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I have faith in Mason. I have faith in Jennings. I think Ray Ray will fill in de- decently. He's certainly not Debo, but I think we can get some of the same functionality uh, and, and putting defense in conflict a little bit, just not the mm-hmm. physicality. Um, so yeah, I'm with you hundred percent. Uh, you know, I know we're coming up here on the hour, so I, I want to be mindful of your time, Brian, if you have another commitment, I don't want to hold you up and make you late. So, uh, I, I do. Um, 
Uh, I've got about 10 minutes left. Um, oh, okay. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, let's chat a yeah. little bit more then. Uh, definitely don't want to cut things off just because we're at an hour. Sure. Um, so we're both in agreement there. What about the rest of the season? So like, um, you know, the sort of, uh, last third or maybe a little less than a third of the season now, maybe yeah. getting closer to a quarter of the season left now, but, uh, games left, including the Seattle game. Yeah. So you were saying we got the Seahawks this Thursday, a week from mm -hmm. Sunday, we've got the commanders, uh, uh um, at Levi's. Saturday, Saturday. Uh, yeah. Christmas That's Eve. Right. That's yeah. right. A week from Saturday. Yeah. That's why the dates weren't working out. Why it was eight days between yeah. that game and and, and and this New Year's Eve day, uh, you know, New Year's Day game New in day, Las yeah. Vegas. Yep. Okay, got it. And the cards at the end of the season. Yeah. So, uh, do you think we'll run the table then, or what? What's your prediction? Well, like I said, the 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 number two seed is 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 well within play, right? They are one game behind the Seahawks or the Seahawks, the Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, the Vikings have three losses. Uh, the 49ers have four. I haven't looked to see if they finish with the same record. Um, I haven't looked yet what the tiebreaker would be. I mean, it would go conference record. And I believe the 49ers have a better conference record uh, than the, than the Vikings do. So that would, you know, they would get the, the, they would get the tiebreaker there. Um, the Vikings, <laughs> the Vikings schedule their last four. I mean, they should win all four of them, but they're also kind of a, a weird three loss team. Like they don't, they don't feel like a number two seed. They don't feel like a three loss team. Uh, they feel like, you know, they feel like a team that really got their ass kicked by the lions on Sunday. Right. Like, you know, not that the, the lions offense has been incredible this, this season and their defense has, has gotten a lot better uh, as the season has, has gone on. And they're actually, you know, believe it or not, they're still in the playoff picture, uh, even though they have, uh, I think they have seven losses right now, but I, it, it really, it, it, the interesting thing to me will be, what do they do if they win on Thursday, right? They, they clinch the division. If they win on Thursday, then the question becomes, do you, do you push for that two seed or do you kind of pull back, maybe rest some players, uh, get them ready for, uh, give them ready for the playoffs, especially if you're looking at possibly that those last two games, the New Year's Day against the Raiders and then the season finale against uh, against the Cardinals. Do I think they could win out? I absolutely do think they could win out. And if if they if if they enter each of those these games looking to win, I think they can win all four. Um, I just don't know that they are. And so I, I'll say I'll say that they'll go three and one over their final four especially if, you know, it, it looks like, you know, number two is not the, or the two seed is not, uh, is not something that they can, th that they can attain. But like I said, it, I, I think it's important and I think it would be important to them to host two playoff games instead of just one. And so I, I think they're going to push to, 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 to at least try it. Right. All they can do is control what they do. So I think that they will they will push to win their last four games, right? Wouldn't it be sweet to go into the the playoffs on a ten game win streak? Like that would be awesome as well. Um, so I think they'll end up going three and one, uh, just because it's 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 hard to predict a, a ten game win streak in the NFL. It just seems really kind of ridiculous if you think about it. But <laughs> I mean there isn't a team that's playing better right now anywhere in the NFL, um, including the Cowboys, including the Eagles. I mean, you could argue the Eagles are, but I don't know. They're, I'm not afraid of the Eagles. I, I know a lot of people are. I'm not afraid of them. Uh, I don't think they, they don't have the, they don't have the experience that this, that this 49er squad does in the playoffs. Their only experience is getting rolled by the Bucks last year in the first round. So while they are a good team and they've got a lot of talent and Jalen Hurts is playing at an MVP level, things get different in the playoffs. They do. And so, um, you know, I, I, I genuinely believe that uh, as long as Brock Purdy, I, Brock Purdy doesn't even need to play like he did the past two games. He just needs to be steady because this defense is going to keep them in every game. No doubt about it. Yeah, I had been saying for a while now, 11 and 6. 
But, you know, it's starting to get hard to find two losses um, here towards the end. So I'm kind of with you. I think three and one, uh, which would take us to 12 and five for the season. Okay. I think that seems pretty realistic. I think the commanders are the one that worry me the most. But Seattle and Seattle won't be easy in a close game. Anything could happen. So either one of those two games we could drop. We could drop both, but I don't think we will. So so I'm, I'm with you there. And we, we could run the table. Um It'll be interesting to see, um, you know, as far as the Eagles go, yeah, they're they're banged up at safety. Um, the uh, uh, Cowboys are banged up in the secondary as well, too. And uh, the <clears throat> Vikings uh, were missing uh, Christian Derrissaw, their left tackle. Yeah. I think that's been hurting them some. So it'll be interesting sure. to see how it all plays out. But, yeah, I would love to get the, the seed, the better seed, as long as – well. <clears throat> And a good thing that I always say is like, you know, top top uh, organizations don't tank, and not that we'd be tanking by resting at the end, but it's sort of like a yeah. mini tank. And and so uh, you know, I always say like, winning isn't a light switch, right? It's not something you can just flick on and flick off, or flick off and then flick back on. A lot of times you turn it off and it doesn't doesn't come back uh, when you when you want to on demand. So. Um, as long as we're not going to end up, you know, tiring ourselves out or injuring ourselves too much to do it, I'd like to see us keep keep the winning streak going too. But um, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out for sure. And I know we're definitely getting up against it here now uh, for your next appointment. So Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely, it was a pleasure, Ted. I enjoyed talking ball with Ted. It, Talks ball. It, it's definitely it's it was fun for sure. Uh, we'll have to do it again sometime before too long. I uh, just want to just check the comments real quick. Um, Kali was saying the two seed would be huge, and peaking at the right time, guys, hundred percent, and momentum over peaking rest. The, so yeah, peaking at the right time is is key in in the NFL and the NFL postseason, and and and. They definitely are right now. No doubt about it. Cool. Yeah. Well, Brian, everybody check Brian out at uh, 49ers Web Zone. And, um, you know, again, thanks for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. I, I appreciate you supporting me as a fledgling, um, you know, YouTube uh, streamer, content creator. Absolutely. And uh, if there's anything I can ever do to help pay you back, let me know. I'm big on repaying debts. So. Love it. Appreciate it, Ted. Have a good one, bud. All right. Take care, bud. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.